So there's very few songs. I uh, talked to several people that I know that know music really well. There's very few songs that are so closely tied to one event. Um, you know, I thought of We Are the World because I'm an old man. Um, you know, I thought of uh, some of the 60s war protest songs because I'm an old man. I don't know what today's current version of that would be. But here's what I do know about this song. It's a, it's a remarkable, remarkable song because it is thousands of years later. And it's still being spoken. You can't sing it anymore because we don't know the tune. You know, thousands of years from now, we don't talk about Bruno is not going to be on the airwaves. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's just whatever current number one, it just doesn't happen. But the reason for this one to be so significant and so long lasting is because of its message. Now, there's no verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, bridge, chorus. That's why I wanted you to read it all, to hear it all, um, but also to, to have your Bibles open because we can't just go straight through it. What we're gonna do instead is just grab themes, right? And I've got three of them and uh, we'll go fairly quickly this morning, uh, but I just wanted to show you this because it is so significant. There are themes like, who is God and what is he like? I would, rather, I would say there is no more important question than that. Who is God? What is he like? What does he do? What does it matter? All of those questions are critical to everyone on the planet. And this has some answers to it. Who is God? What is he like? Oh, by the way, also, what was the whole reason for the Exodus? So that they might know him. How many times did you see that throughout Exodus 1 through 14? So that they might know him, not just the Egyptians, but the Israelites as well. We used to, uh, again, you skip down to kind of the center, verse 11. It says, who, is, who among the gods is like you, Lord? Who is like you? Majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders. That little verse, that verse 11, is like the summation of a lot of stuff that's kind of scattered throughout. And so, for example, we go right up to the top. Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Highly exalted, above all, worthy. Um, I don't know what other translate or other translations you might have or other interpretations you might have, but there's no comparison. There's no equal. There's no challenge. When my friend Cal used to do children's uh, camps and youth camps, on the first day of camp, he used to stand in front of all the children and he would say, me, Cal, your camp director, you, yes, for the next week, you orbit around me. I am the center of your universe. <laughs> and he would just deliver that, right? But Jesus is the only one who actually is the center of the universe. Colossians 1.17 says, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Think of that. Highly exalted is there is no challenge to God's authority and God's sovereignty. And I know it's really hard to imagine that when things in your own personal lives or when things on a world scale happen that you just kind of go, but, 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 but. <laughs> but there is no challenge to a highly exalted God. Verse three says, the Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Warrior means he will battle those who threaten his. <clears throat> now, the bad news about that is he will battle you if you're threatening you. <laughs> and the good news about that is he will battle you if you are threatening you. If your mindsets, if your habits, if your um, actions, if your thoughts, if you have things inside of you that are against you, he will fight for you. He will fight for you um, victoriously. We'll talk about it in a sec, but he will fight for you. The Lord is his name. He actually said it several times. Yahweh is actually the word. Again, and as our was, was, and as our was, were, has, have, had, be, being, been, do, done, did, shall, should, count. You remember, right? Hope. <laughs> he is everything he needs to be at all times. That's what Yahweh means. Um, Yahweh is his name. Verse six, your right hand, uh, Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, Lord, shouted the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you threw down those who uh, uh, opposed you. Um, that word majesty can also be translated excellency or glorious. So 
All of these words, you take them all together, and they're kingly words. They're exalted words. And indeed, verse 18 says, the Lord reigns forever and ever. That's a kingly word. So you put it all together, and what we have is a highly exalted warrior king forever. I want to sing about that thousands from years from now. We will sing about that thousands of years from now. A highly exalted warrior king forever. And while we rightly celebrate that, it stuns me to also think, as I was writing this, it stuns me to also think that we believe that somehow we can give him suggestions. <laughs> highly exalted warrior king forever. And somehow we get in our minds that he's supposed to be our assistant to make things happy and comfortable for me. Who is God and what is he like is one of the most important questions we ever ask. We've used those four questions. Who is God? What has he done? Uh, who does that make me? And how now do we get to live? In this song, who is he? He is the highly exalted warrior king forever. <laughs> what has he done? The example of that is the Red Sea. What does that make me? What does that make the Israelites on the other side of the Red Sea? Grateful <laughs> and humble. Dare I say it, submissive. Highly exalted warrior king forever is not someone that we barge into. It is not someone that we shake our finger at. Now, but he's also father. He's also close. He also accepts our anger and our frustration. He also receives us when we're at our absolute worst. He also gives us grace. He also gives us forgiveness. He also is this great warrior king who is fighting for us. We have to have both sides of that. There's a second theme, and it's overwhelming victory. Again, we're just going to skip through. Verse 4 says, Barriots. Barriots. That's, that's, a, that's a chariot being driven by a ferret. Um, Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has hurled into the sea. Just, just take that picture. When was the last time you saw a horse thrown anywhere? It's, I mean... When was the last time you saw a car thrown anywhere by anything other than what, a tornado? Flood? This is the image. We, we read it and we think, okay, that's that old song. You know, the, the horse and rider, he is thrown into the sea. But think about it. Horse and chariot, just with the ease that you and I would throw a baseball. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the best of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the Red Sea. Not just any of them, the best. Your right hand, Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, Lord, shattered the enemy. By the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The surging waters stood up like a wall. Uh, verse nine is fantastic. The enemy boasted, I will pursue. I will overtake them. I will divide the spoils. I will gorge myself on them. This is so, so, uh, I don't know what. Um, I will draw my sword and my hand will destroy them. Verse 10, but you blew with your breath and the sea covered them. So just, just use your glorified imaginations for just a second here. The, the enemy is like, I will bathe in their blood. I mean, he is just, he is really, really lots of bravado and lots of machismo, lots of, lots of, uh, you know, and I will do these things. And God is like, <laughs> it's fantastic it is an overwhelming victory that was never at any question whatsoever ever when the ten plagues are raining down when some of the ten plagues are affecting the Israelites it was never in doubt when they get cast out of Egypt and they're last week when they've got the Red Sea behind them and the Egyptian army in front of them and they are freaked out and afraid the victory was never in doubt ever you blew with your breath. <laughs> this was not hard. God humiliated the enemy of his people. 
despite the enemy's taunting and boasting, God breathed <laughs> and shattered them. It reminds me that that reminded me of and I've, I've never quite understood it. I actually heard it taught recently and it didn't stick. But do you remember the moment in when Jesus is being crucified, or sorry, arrested? And there's this moment where they are, you know, coming toward him or whatever. And they ask, I, don't, I just I should have looked at the details here, but they ask him like who he is or something. All he or says is, I am. I am. Yeah, he says, I am, and they fall down. <laughs> For why? They did not fall down because of submission. They did not fall down because of some sort of, you know, oh, this is a, a king that we should bow down to. It, something about his presence in that exact moment was enough to where he just spoke and they went, <clears throat> whoa. I just don't, I don't know. Overwhelming victory. Who is he and what is he like? He gives overwhelming victory over everything that threatens us most. And the final theme of uh, is this, all of this, who he is, what he's done, is for the purpose of leading into a promised future. Verse 13, verse 13 is one of them that you can actually pull out of context safely. Yes, it's about the Red Sea, but we can pull it out of context safely because it is true for all people for all time. In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. That also is never in question. You will lead the people you have redeemed. So in other words, when you feel less, or sorry, when you feel most like, I have no clue what's going on. I don't know what's going to happen next. I'm a little worried, blah, 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 blah. He will lead. I've said many, many, many times to many, many, many people, <laughs> if you are open to God's will, he'll give it. He just doesn't look at an open heart and go, nah. Your unfailing love will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. What a promise. The nations will hear and tremble. This is verse 14. Anguish will grip the people of Philistia. The chiefs of Edom will be terrified. The leaders of Moab will be seized with trembling. The people of Canaan will melt away. Terror and dread will fall on them. By the power of your arm, they will be still as stone until... There's a beautiful song that is uh, anchored by that word until. Until your people pass by, Lord. Until the people you bought pass by. You will bring them in and plant them on the mountain of your inheritance. The place, Lord, you made for your dwelling. The sanctuary, Lord, your hands established. And again, this is that whole transition point where we're, we're moving out of getting out of Egypt. And we're moving into getting into the promised land. Exodus makes the shift. We need to make the shift as we talk about it. And it's because of this, and this is what we'll talk about for the next several weeks. Getting out is not what we really want. Escape for all of its hoped for happiness is not what we want. We want what's on the other side. We need to be brought into something new. Right? I mean, stopping something bad Good, awesome. It's not really what we want, though, is it? Don't we also want to start something good? Getting out of a bad situation, leaving something behind that has plagued you and bothered you for years and years and years. Okay, great, awesome, wonderful. Don't you also want to move into something new? That's next week and thereafter. Both verses uh, 6 and 12 refer to your right hand. It's a picture of God's personal power. God himself has rescued his people. He is a personal God. That is evidenced by verse 2. The Lord is my strength, my defense, my salvation, my God. I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. So we have <laughs> an exalted warrior king who effortlessly defeats our enemies and ensures our promised future. That's the good news of the morning. That's the good news of all time. A majestic and glorious king battling on behalf of his people to bring them in. Now, when you're reading scripture on your own, 
one of the questions you got to be asking is, what does it matter? <laughs> this is thousands of years ago, events we can only imagine. But when you begin to pull on some kinds of those, those themes that I just did, suddenly it's like, oh, well, okay. They had an exalted warrior king whose, uh, def uh, sorry, whose victory was effortless. Uh, so do we. Ours is ensured by the cross. Ours is ensured by Jesus. And also, I found myself this week asking, what place do songs of celebration have in moments of pain? It's a small room, small crowd. I know some of you are hurting. I know some people that might see this later are hurting. We obviously know the things that are going on in the world. So what good are songs of victory when we're hurting? And the answer to that, I want to take you right back to the very top. And we'll close with this. Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord for he is highly exalted. Period. Stop. He hasn't thrown the horse and the rider into the sea yet. Not in the song. Obviously, he has in history. But just look at that phrase. I sing for he is highly exalted. Why do you sing? Because he's highly exalted. He is highly exalted before any mention of the Red Sea miracle. And it is significant that those are character qualities before. God is never trying to prove himself. He is love. He is power. He is these things. And we exalt him because he is these things. He graciously gives us evidence. But he doesn't have to because he already is these things. He is the exalted warrior king before he fights. He is the one who takes us out to bring us in before we are in, right? He is these things whether he proves it or not to us in our eyes. And he is the only being in existence where this is true. I mean, if I say I love my family and uh, consistently ignore them, well, then we got to start questioning whether or not I love them. <laughs> but when God says I am love, that's it. That's actually where it stops. And then he graciously offers evidences. But my point is, is that, you know, like my old pastor used to say, he is for you no matter what's happening to you. He is highly exalted even when we are trampling his courts. He is praiseworthy even when life isn't going particularly well right now. These are truths about God, true no matter what. So if you're celebrating, celebrate with these truths. And if you're lamenting, lament with these truths. Jesus, on the night that he would be betrayed, on the night that he would be betrayed, on the way to his rest, Matthew 26, 30 says, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Of course we can sing after victories. You part the Red Sea for me, and I'm going to be really, really happy and easy. And it'll be a song, and I will sing at the top of my lungs, and it'll be bad because I can't sing very well. But you know what? I don't care. But to sing in the shadows, they're equally true both places. This is like, this is just a little bit of a soapbox kind of drives me crazy when people talk about how good God is when things turn out the way that they think they should. Now, yeah, God is good. My, my dad got healed. My uh, son came to Christ. My uh, job, I got an interview and, you know, I got a, 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 a raise, you know, I got a promotion. Yeah, God is good. But if you get passed over for the promotion, he's still good. When your mom doesn't recover, he's still good. This, it's, you're nodding. You get the point. Song is particularly well equipped to do this. 
because I learned um, with hospice actually that that part of the brain is really, really well protected. It's why even people who have forgotten their own children can still sing Amazing Grace or How Great Thou Art. Songs help us remember. When they are true, they are portable theology and songs endure. Uh, science tells us that the songs that you remember most are the songs that you learned between about the ages of 15 and 30. Those are the ones that stick. Because, you know, I'm 53 now, so everything right now is just trash. Because <laughs> everything back then is perfect. <laughs> but it's, that's going to be the same way for her. You know, the songs that she will remember when she is my age are the songs that she knows now. It was just going to get repeated. Songs endure, but more importantly, these truths endure. We keep putting the same truths to new words. We keep putting the same truths to new melodies. And thank goodness we do, because it's giving newer generations a chance to remember greatest life faithfulness. When I'm on my deathbed, I'll sing greatest life faithfulness. I'll sing. Uh, uh, I can't remember the name of the song. Sure. God is the strength of my heart. Uh, when you're younger ones, I don't know what you'll sing. You're going to sing one of these that you learned here or another truth. They move through history, these truths, person to person. That is why verse 15, or chapter 15, verse 1 and 20 all end the same, or they're the same. Then Moses and Israelites sang the song of the Lord. I will sing to the Lord. He is highly exalted, both horse and driver. He is curled into the sea. Verse 20. Then Miriam the prophet, Aaron's sister, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women followed her with timbrels and dancing. And Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted, both horse and driver. He is curled into the sea. Moses wrote it, taught it, Miriam repeated it. That's what the church is called to do. We've been taught beautiful, wonderful things about God. We have been taught he is love. He is power. He is good, no matter what. <coughs> Guess what? It's our role to repeat that, not just to ourselves, but to others, because they need to hear it. Because these are things that are true, no matter what. As I said, on the night that he was betrayed, he sang a hymn. I don't know what hymn it was. There's guesses out there, by the way. But they sang a hymn. Look at that. Jesus knows he is eating his last meal with his friends. He knows that he is about to be betrayed by one of the guys that has followed him for three years. He knows that as they leave this place, it's over, right? I mean, literally his last meal. Like the electric chair is next. And on the way to the garden, or he would be arrested. He is singing a hymn of the truth about who this God is. So powerful. We have uh, bread and we have the little uh, cups of juice. Uh, you're welcome to pick up the bread and the cup or just the cup because the cup, if you remember, has a little bread wafer thing on top. <laughs> and some people... <laughs> Some people are going, oh, no, don't make me. <laughs> so I feel like most people are just going to grab bread, and that's good. Um, but as we sing, what I want us to do is just, you know, take the bread, take the cup, go back to your seats. We'll sing together, and then all together we will uh, receive the Lord's Supper at the end of the song and at the end of our service here. But Father God, I just want to thank you for uh, just the the massive number of truths that are contained in your word. Why we ignore or cheat ourselves of seeking it out and finding it, I, I, I don't know. Um, but I just want to thank you for the massive amount of unchangeable truth that is in your word. Truth about who we are, truth about who you are, truth about how you work, truth about how you act, truth about the world around us and how it works. 
God, I, I pray and ask that you would embed all of that much more deeply inside of each of us. And also allow us to remember what we've been taught. Allow it to shape us and form us and, and make us more Christ-like. And in that Christ-likeness, may we pass along the wonderful, wonderful things that you've done and are doing. Talking to children, always do. Some of them, young enough to only recognize, you know, a simple truth like Jesus loves me. May that simple truth in their life grow over time so that they really recognize even more and more Jesus, <laughs> the Jesus, loves me. And again, may that truth spill over in other people's lives too. May we become Miriam who picks up the, the tambourine, symbolically at least, just says it again. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.